All right, so we're going to start talking about the Civil War itself here. Um, today, we're going to, before we get into the actual conflict, though, because we will get into that mostly next week, uh, we're going to talk about kind of the, the status of things going into the war. To understand the Civil War, you really have to understand the differences between the North and the South and the nature of each and in terms of its outcome. So the first thing we're going to talk about is preparations for war, how both North and South were prepared, and uh, what were the relative advantages and disadvantages of each side. Now, to begin with, let's first of all look at the status of the Union in 1861. So this map kind of shows you what you know the country kind of looked like by mid-1861 when the war was really underway. So we got a lot of things going on here. First of all, Everything you see shaded in green, okay, represented the, the states that had actually seceded from the Union. Okay? So these are the states that are going to make up the Confederacy. Okay? The, the Confederacy or the Confederate States of America is the name of the country that was attempting to be created by those southern rebellious states. Okay? Now in the north, okay, everything you see shaded in yellow, okay, was a northern union free state. Okay, so these were still states that had not seceded. They were still part of the United States of America. Now, even though they are part of the United States of America, we kind of, during the Civil War, oftentimes don't refer to the North as that. Okay, because we have the first distinction between the North and the North South. So, even though it is the United States of America, we oftentimes just refer to the North States as the Union. Okay, or as the North. Those terms are really interchangeable, just like the South and the Confederacy are also interchangeable. Now, the question then lies, what, what about these guys in the middle here? What about these orange in this one brown state, right? So those are our border states, okay? Now I'm gonna remind, I've talked about this before, I'm gonna remind you again. The border states are those southern, geographically they are southern, okay? Southern slave-holding states that remained in the Union. That is the definition for border states. Southern slave-holding states that remained in the Union. So despite the fact that these are considered southern, and they had slaves, of course, slavery was a big part of the Civil War. They stayed in the Union. Now, why? Well, it's a mixed bag as to why. Some of it's because they wanted to, some of it's because they weren't prevented to leave. Okay. Abraham Lincoln, when he got in office, he used his powers in a lot of ways to prevent these states from actually seceding. He did this by sending in troops to occupy the states and also even arresting Southern sympathizers. Okay. But for whatever reason, okay, they are going to remain in the Union. That is, of course, going to be very vital to the outcome of the war because okay, they are going to affect the outcome because, of course, they contribute more power to the North. But this is the situation as we see it by mid-1861. And another thing that's important to know is you look at the two capitals. And of course, Washington, D.C. was the capital of the Union, as it was before. And then, of course, for their capital, the Confederacy chose Richmond, Virginia. Okay, you can see the two are, are very close. They're only about 100 or so miles apart from each other. So the two capitals of the rival factions right across from each other. And the really great thing is, even though they're so close to each other, neither capital was ever taken or, or seized until really the last year of the war. So even though they were so close, the fighting raged so fiercely that neither side was able to overcome the other and seize their capital, which is oftentimes a goal in war. It's more psychological victory than anything else. Okay, so what we're going to get into now, this is pretty much all we're going to do today. Very straightforward lecture. We're going to look at the relative advantages and disadvantages of each side. Now, really, you have to know both advantages and disadvantages. Not necessarily, you know, I think it's acceptable. If you just know the advantages of each side, you kind of, by virtue of that, know the disadvantages. Because, for example, if one side has a naval advantage, that probably means the other side is disadvantaged in that regard. Not always, but usually. Okay, so you can put a little chart in your notes if you want, or you can make you can just write about it. I don't care how you do this. Okay, if you want to make it real simple, you just want to make a T chart in which on one side we talk about southern advantages, and on the other side we talk about the northern. So you can do something like that. We talk about advantages. That's one way to do it. Your call. I don't care, but you do need to know this. Okay, I do expect you to know this because by analyzing the advantages and disadvantages of either side we can kind of get a better understanding as to why the North obviously won the war. I hope I'm not spoiling this for anyone, but North wins, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and get into this. All right, so the first one, this chart goes into a lot of things. What was that, question? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand, I'm sorry. 
Okay, so the first thing we're looking at is population and economy, which actually turned out to be a pretty major factor in determining this war. You know, the Civil War is going to be a long war. Contrary to everyone's belief, everyone thought it was going to be short, both North and South thought, oh, you know, we're going to go win a couple of battles, it's going to be fun, and it's going to be over, we're going to win. That's what everyone always thinks. Every war, that's what everyone thinks. But it always turns out that no, wars are much harder to win than you know, usually expected. And the Civil War is going to turn into a long, drawn out war, you know, kind of attrition in a lot of ways. And in long wars, we find that one of the most important variables in helping to win that is who has the most people and who has the most money. Okay? Because in a long war, it's really not about who wins the war, it's about who quits first. Okay? And the side that quits first is usually the one that, you know, is decimated in terms of their population or in terms of their ability to wage war economically. So overall, this chart goes into specifics, and I'm not going to go through each one, but overall we can say that the North had an advantage when it came to population and economy. First of all, total population, the North had 71% of the people. Okay, right there, just in general, they had more people, which would lead you to believe they had more workers and more soldiers. Okay? They had more money. Look at bank deposits. 81% of all the bank deposits, the value, the currency, was in the North. The North was richer than the South. Wars are won with money many times. Okay? They had more factories in the North. This is not a surprise. You know that. Which means they could make more stuff. Okay? Things that they would need to win the war. Okay? Now, the only thing on this entire chart that really stands out as an advantage at all for the South is cotton. The South, of course, had 99% of the cotton production. Now that does matter because, of course, cotton could be useful in the war because they can sell that cotton and use the funds from cotton sales to fund the war. Okay? So theoretically, cotton could be an advantage. You might even want to know that. It is not necessarily going to pan out by war's end, but we, you know, they didn't know that at the time. So cotton was expected to be, of course, a huge advantage in South because they could sell that cotton and use the, the money they received from that cotton to wage the war. But almost on every single measure other than cotton, okay, even in food, people always go, oh, the South is better than the feast tree. That's actually incorrect. The North actually was home to most of the food farming. The South was so consumed with cotton production that they actually neglected foodstuffs. The North is actually where we had our breadbasket states that produced most of our grain and food. So actually, despite the South being agriculturally based, the North had more food. Okay, so you can look at the rest there. Okay, but for the most part, the North, on almost every single economic measure, outperformed the South, which means they were better equipped to fund and wage a long war, which is what this war is going to be. All right, so keep that in mind. Now, this chart breaks it down further, and you know, there's some stuff we learned out, but it, it basically also explains just how disadvantaged the South was in terms of population. Not only did the South have less people total of that populace, let's not forget about one third were slaves. Now, are slaves completely useless in war? No, they're not. Slaves are useful because, of course, they are the ones doing work behind the lines. They're doing the tending of the crops and manual labor and doing all these things. So slavery is an advantage. You can even write that down. Slavery was actually an advantage for the South, partially. But it's only a partial advantage. Because what can slaves not be counted on to do? Fight. fight. The South never seriously considered arming slaves in great numbers to fight. There are a couple of examples in which there were experiments in which the South did use slaves as soldiers. But like I said, these were very rare and really are not significant enough to even talk about. Okay? Slaves could not be counted on to fight because, of course, slaves were not willing to fight and die defend a side that was trying to keep them in slavery. Not to mention slaves also kind of were also another disadvantage in the sense that in order to keep the slaves under control you had to keep men back. You had to leave soldiers back home on the home front to watch over the slave population to discourage them from revolting and running away. So even still the South had to pull troops back that they could have used for the war to keep control of the slaves. So slaves were both an advantage and a disadvantage. But overall, I would say slavery really was a disadvantage in the sense that they could not rely upon that populace to fight. But it was both. You could argue it both ways, so you should know that. 
Okay, now economically speaking, here's a specific economic advantage. We talked about earlier in the year, we talked about railroads. The north was home to most of our railroad production, our, our tracks. Okay, you can look at this map and you can see that. Okay, why does this matter? Well, it matters. Okay, it you know, made it easier to move men and goods around. And of course, the North is going to be waging an offensive war if they're trying to invade the South. They're going to need to be able to move men and supplies to the front as quickly as possible. Okay, wars are won on logistics, how able a country is able to get supplies to the front lines. Okay, that's actually very important in warfare. All right, so the fact that the North had a greater network of Railroads actually made them better equipped to fight a war of this nature, which is war fought on an industrial or a large scale. You look at the South, they had far less railroad production than the North. And he makes things even worse. By war's end, a lot of this railroad network that's already existed will be destroyed. One of the things the North does as they invade the South is they actually make it their, their goal to destroy Southern infrastructure. And the reason being is by destroying that infrastructure, it would sap the southern will to fight. So they actually are going to destroy southern crops, southern homes, southern railroads, and it's going to leave the south in a state of just absolute devastation when the war is over. So overall, railroads were a union advantage. Okay, moving along. This is kind of me. I mean, I guess I'm kind of saying the same thing. So we're talking about resources. This is economics. You can look at the numbers there, um, but the main idea here is, of course, the North, not surprising, had more resources, period. They had more raw materials in terms of iron and railroad tracks and money and factories and workers. Workers are a resource, right? I mean, I think one of the most interesting statistics on this graph here is this one right down here that gives you an idea just how far ahead the North was in the South in terms of production. Look at this one right here, firearms. Can you all see that? 32 to 1 ratio, which means the North can produce 32 guns for every one the South can produce. I mean, that really, that is, I mean, that really shows the North is just so much more industrialized than the South. Okay, and a real, I mean, that, that's a direct application of war, guns. Who has more guns, right? More and better guns, actually. By war's end, the North actually was developing some gun technology that was more sophisticated than what the South had as well. This is a union advantage. Now, once again, not surprising, the side that has the most people was also able to field the most troops. Okay, both sides had very large armies. However, the Northern Army was always larger. And in almost every single battle of the Civil War, almost every single battle, not every single one, but most, in almost every single battle of the Civil War, the North had more men. Now, what's really interesting is despite having more men, the South actually inflicted almost early on in the war, even numbers of casualties or more so. So the South actually performed better with their limited resources. But despite that, this is a long war. And if we had to guess which side was going to run out of men or money first, we would get to the South. Okay. Now also, you look at 1863 was the peak year for both armies. Both, that's when they had the most troops. Because in 1863, a couple things happened. First of all, in 1863, both sides began to draft which means they began to forcibly conscript soldiers from their pockets. They weren't just volunteers anymore. Because by 1863, people were not volunteering in great numbers because they didn't want to go fight and die anymore. This was not, they realized, oh, this war is not exciting. This war is not fun. People die. Okay, now that's one reason, but the other thing that's also important here is starting in 1863, the Union also began to do something that the South couldn't do. And that means they began to enlist black soldiers. Black soldiers were not utilized from day one. But by 1863, the North began to enlist black soldiers who served and segregated all black units. Okay, This added hundreds of thousands of more men to the Northern Army by war then and gave them a fighting advantage over the South, who could not rely on their African-American population. Okay, So keep that in mind. Also a union advantage. So so far I'm talking about a lot of union advantages. They, oh, wow, this is going to be a really one-sided war. Hold on. Confederate does have some advantages, and we're going to get to them. Okay, contributing to that population was immigration, right? The North had a bigger populace. One of the reasons why the North had a bigger populace is because immigrants were going there, all right? Immigrants were coming to America, and they were more, you know, they mostly landed in northern seaboard cities, okay? 
And that is where they usually stay because that is where their job opportunities were, and that's also oftentimes you know, they didn't have any money to go elsewhere. In most cases, not all. Okay, the South had far less immigration than the North. Now, this played a factor in the war because the the U.S. Army did recruit from the immigrant population. In fact, it wasn't uncommon for when a ship pulled in, bringing in people coming to America, they would sometimes have a recruiter right there on the docks, waiting. And you'd step off that ship and be like, hey, you want to sign up for the U.S. Army? And if you're a poor immigrant coming over from Ireland or wherever, and you had no money or no job, Army sounded like a good idea, you know? You got a meal, three a day, and you got paid, why not? So we had entire regiments in the Union Army that were made up of foreign-born people, okay? So that also contributed to the uh, the Union Army side. So this is a Union advantage. All right, let's get into some more important stuff. Now let's talk about civil leadership. So there's two kinds of leadership that are important in a war. Your civil leadership and your military leadership. So let's start with civil leadership. We're talking about the leader. We're talking about our political leaders in the war. Okay? We're talking about presidents, Congress, so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> When we talk about president, you know, the president is the face of civil leadership, so that's why we focus on the president. When we talk about the presidents, and we got two presidents in the Civil War, right? We got, for the North, we got Abraham Lincoln, which you all already know. And then for the South, you had the Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. All right? So the question then becomes, which was the better leader? Okay? This is, of course, subjective. But typically... History has been kinder to Abraham Lincoln. I mean, think about it. Abraham Lincoln today is usually regarded as one of the best presidents of all time, right? At least top three, usually, in polls. And rightfully so. He was a very good leader, okay? But does that necessarily mean that Jefferson Davis was terrible? Not necessarily. Yes, Lincoln was a very good leader, although at the time, many people were very critical of him. He was actually probably one of the most hated presidents of all time as well, when he was in office, if you think about it, right? He won with only 40% of the popular vote, and when he got elected, what happened? Half the country left. That's never happened before when anyone else got elected. So that, that means he was very unpopular, right? Um, but that's just, you know, that's how things are. Sometimes history, you know, when we look back in retrospect, we realize that, you know, some people were better than they were treated at the time. So anyways, Lincoln is oftentimes regarded, he was a good leader, but we also have to consider this. Lincoln probably had an easier job in running his country. Now think about this for a minute. Think about the nature of the Union and its makeup. And then think about the nature of the Confederacy and its makeup. Why was Lincoln's job easier in terms of running a country than Jefferson Davis's job? Yes. He had all the advantages. Well, so far he's had all the advantages. We're going to get to the Confederate advantages. Don't think that they're, they don't have They will have some. Yeah. Up and in the South, they were just figuring it out. So, so partially, yeah, the United States has a long history, right? We, we, we've been around for a while. Our Constitution is solid. I mean, it's all in place. The South had to start from scratch. That's part of it. There's one other thing, though. That's a very important part, though. Yeah. The South, like, the slaves, like, there was tension There was tension. Remember, the South was pretty much unified on the issue of slavery. So, but here's what I want to say. Think about the South itself. What is it about the Confederacy and what they stood for, besides slavery, that would make being president of them harder? What was that division? There it is. States' rights, right? So what is states' rights? States' rights is the idea that the states are actually, at the end of the day, supreme in terms of power over the federal government. Right? So think about that. The South was a collection of really independent states. And they ultimately, because of states' rights, were the power of the federal government. Jefferson Davis had a very difficult time wrangling these states together and getting them to do anything because they could just say no. Now, Lincoln, on the other hand, he could say, okay, this is what we're going to do. The states are like, okay, let's go. But Jefferson Davis had to kind of beg and plead. In fact, there are times during the Civil War when some of the southern states actually threatened to secede from the Confederacy. They were going to secede from secession, as crazy as that sounds. That's the kind of stuff that Jefferson Davis had to deal with. So Jefferson Davis, you know, I mean, he's usually not held in high regard for a lot of reasons. I mean, arguably he's a traitor in this country. Um, but, you know, like I said, he had a much difficult, more difficult task ahead of him than Lincoln. Lincoln, of course, had supreme authority. And Lincoln was not, by the way, let me make this point clear, it's actually important for your notes. 
But some of you might, might miss it notes if I don't say it. Lincoln was not afraid to wield power. And in many cases, wield absolute power. Lincoln, in many times, would either bend or even completely break the rules to get stuff done. For example, one of the things that Lincoln was really heavily criticized for when he was president was when the war broke out, he used every trick in the book to keep those border states in the Union. And one of the things he did was he marched troops into the, these the border states, he declared martial law, and he even suspended certain liberties. Now, this is completely unconstitutional. For example, one of the things that Lincoln did, this is what he's most criticized for, was he suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Okay, you need to know this. This is important. Habeas corpus. You want to write that down if you don't already know what it is from the study guide. Habeas corpus is one of our most cherished rights that we all hold dear. It's in the Constitution. Habeas corpus is your right to be presented before a judge when you are charged with a crime. If you are arrested for a crime, you are required by law, you must, in a very quick period of time, by the way, they can't keep you there long, you have to be brought before a judge and told what crime you're being charged with. This is an important right because this right is what protects you from the police arresting you and just keeping you in jail forever without ever having a crime. If we didn't have the right to habeas corpus, the police could just go, okay, um, you know, you're under arrest, wait in jail until we figure out what we want to do with you. And they might just leave you in there for 20 years. And they go, uh, okay, we didn't want to do anything, get out. So it protects us from being unfairly held by the state. Lincoln suspended this. Now, why? Well, he, he went around and he arrested anyone who was like a Southern sympathizer in the war states. He arrested them, threw them in jail, and he just left them there for the duration of the war. Completely illegal. Completely unconstitutional. Did it anyways. Why? Because Lincoln said, in times of crisis, in times of war, you got to do what's necessary to win. And for him, winning this war meant, in this case, suspending the writ of habeas corpus. So anyways, Lincoln had a lot of power. And he was not afraid to use it if it meant winning the war. And of course, the North did the win, did win the war largely because of his leadership. So he deserves a lot of credit. So overall, civil leadership, we got to say the Union probably had better leadership, or maybe, maybe it wasn't necessarily they had better people, maybe their government structure was superior to the South when it comes to winning a war. I mean, think about the military. There's a reason why we have chain of command military, where there's the president and the generals and the officers. Because you need one person who can make a decision, and everyone else goes to You can't have everyone voting. Because you've got to be able to react, right? That's why we have that chain of command. The president is at the top. The president is the head of the military. Now, what about military leadership? Traditionally, history has usually said that one side had better military leadership. Which side? South. South. The South is usually regarded as having the better military officers. Okay? This could have to do with a lot of things. You know, some people argue there's a greater history of military, um, you know, I don't know, you know, presence in the South. It could be have to do with, you know, you know, the amount of people who are going to the military guys. I don't know. For whatever reason, it appears though, at least early on in the war, the South seemed to have the better pick of military officers. For example, just to give you an example, you can, you know, you can see what I'm talking about. You know, at the beginning of the war, Abraham Lincoln approached Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee, one of the generals, one of those highly regarded generals of the war. And he said, hey, I want you to be my guy. I want you to be my, my general. And Lee declined. He said, look, I, I can't. I have to go to my home state of Virginia. Okay, that's what happened in the Civil War. People had allegiances to their home state. Back in those days, everyone was American, yeah. But most people were most identified by the state. They said, I'm a, a Virginian. I'm a South Carolinian. Okay, I'm a Floridian. So, Officers and just people in general went with their home state. Okay? And when they split, most of the good officers went with the South. Okay? The North is going to struggle greatly for the first couple of years of the war finding able leaders. The first guy they kind of choose is this guy. I'll talk more about him later, George McClellan. Everyone had high aspirations for McClellan. Didn't really pan out. Okay? He doesn't turn out to be that good. So after him, they try and try and try. And they just can't find anyone. Okay, by war's end, the, the North will find a couple winning generals that get the job done. But for most of the war, the North struggled to field competent officers. Most of the really good officers were in the South. And that is why, largely, partially, the South was able to perform so well early on, despite being outmanned, outgunned, and, you know, really disadvantaged in almost every single way. So they, they owe a lot of that. 
What about motive to fight? Think about this. Day one of the Civil War. Now, day one, that's important. Civil War broke out. Which side do you think has the greater passion for their cause? South. South. Right? What was their cause? Well, slavery's part of it. Independence. Right? Think about that. They're fighting for the right to declare themselves an independent state. Now, they're also fighting for their economic freedom, which slavery is very much a part of. The South believes that slavery is eliminated, their entire way of life is over. So they're fighting for their livelihood. I mean, they have got to fight. They're fighting for defense of their homeland. They're fighting for independence. They're fighting for their economic system. That's a lot. Okay? People are willing to die for those things. Now, think about the North. Day one of the Civil War. Now, day one, the North had one cause. This is important to remember. The goal of the North in the Civil War, day one, was preserve the Union. Correct. Preserve the Union. That's it. To preserve the Union. Lincoln even said, if I could save the country, if I could win this war by freeing every slave, I would. If I could win the war by freeing no slaves, I would. The goal was to win the war and preserve the Union. Only later, about halfway through the war, does slavery become the driving issue of the North. Now, that doesn't mean that the war wasn't about slavery. The war was about slavery. Don't get me wrong. The causes of the war largely had to do with slavery and the South fearing the North would take slavery away. But when we talk about the explicitly stated motive of the North, preserve the Union. It's not until 1863 that the war takes on another mission, and that is to preserve the Union and to eliminate slavery. We'll talk more about that later. But anyways, when we talk about motivation to fight, the South is largely credited with having an advantage because they were fighting for home, they were fighting for independence. Okay, this one is very lopsided. This is perhaps the most lopsided measure of all. Naval power. Who has it? North. Right? North is the home to our naval power because, of course, that is also the place where we have most of our ports. So they had most of the Navy. Uh, the South has almost no Navy whatsoever to speak of. In fact, throughout the entire course of the war, the South really, for the most part, you know, is unable to challenge the North for control of the seas. There is a couple situations where the South tries, but for the most part, the South just basically accepted the fact the North They've got the Navy and we don't. Now, you might think, okay, what does that matter, right? I mean, when you think about the Civil War, you don't think about naval combat. You think about battlefields, Gettysburg, Antietam. Turns out naval power is a very important part of this war. It's not so much about engagements at sea. It's about what the lack of a Navy pre prevents you from doing. The South, their entire economy is dependent upon cotton. Well, who was their number one consumer of cotton? Britain. Nope. North. North. Can't sell to them, can they? So now they are forced to sell to their number two consumer, which is Europe, Britain. You can't sell to Europe if you can't get your cotton across the sea safely. Without a navy, how are you going to protect that? So one of the first things the North does when the war breaks out, the North puts a blockade on the South. It says nothing gets in or out. This will cripple the Southern economy and will make cotton their only resource a non-factor. So all that cotton that they were all excited about selling, you know, using to fund their war, it's worthless. Because they can't sell it. Okay? Or it will become worthless. So naval power was a huge, huge Union advantage. Yes? Does that create the issue whether Britain should intervene and help the South? Correct. Now, this, this creates a very sticky situation, is that when you blockade a country, you're not only preventing them from sending stuff out, but you're also preventing other countries from sending stuff in. And when you start harassing other countries' ships, which you guys remember the War of 1812, we weren't at war before, right? We were sending our stuff to Europe, and the British and the French were stopping our ships. And that's how we got sucked into the war. So we have a very dangerous situation in the Civil War is that by blockading the South, there is a possibility that we could upset other countries and that they might get involved. Which there it is. Look at that. Perfect timing. So... When we look at that, we look at which side had the greater possibility of foreign aid, we typically say the South. The South was really the only country that early on was flirting with the idea of getting some outside assistance. Now, I know, and some of you already know this, this foreign assistance never materialized, and I understand that. 
But we're talking about the possibility early on. It was a very real possibility. Okay, The South and their cotton production was very much a big part of the European economy, particularly Great Britain. So the South believed that Britain would be willing to help them fight in order to restore the cotton trade. Okay, and it's true, Great Britain at times considered it. Okay, however, it never did pan out. So this was, however, though, a possibility, it was a Confederate advantage. Now, to give you an idea of just how close we came at one point, in 1861, the first year of the war, one of the things that happened that kind of really almost sparked a war between us and Britain was this thing called the Trent Affair. What was going on was there were these Confederate diplomats, and they were on a ship, and they were headed to Britain. And they were going to go over to Britain and try and meet with their leaders and try and get foreign recognition, foreign aid. Well, a Union warship stopped these diplomats and arrested them and detained them and would not let them go on to England. Now, when England heard about this, they were outraged. Because even though England is not in this war, nothing gives the United States the right to prohibit England from conducting diplomacy with another country, which is what the Confederates were claiming they were. So England actually threatened the United States and said, look, you send these diplomats on their way or else. And like the cartoon shows, the thing we were really terrified of was that British Navy. The British had arguably the greatest Navy in the world. And if they jumped in this war, that would be bad news for the North. Yeah. So who stopped The North stopped the Southern leaders from going to England to try and work a deal. Okay, but England was the one that was very upset, and they threatened us. So we were forced to back down. Abraham Lincoln, he backed down. He said, "Okay, our bad." We let the Confederates go on their way. They met with the English, but ultimately it never panned out. Now, why did it not pan out? Well, for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the reasons that I'll just rather talk about later. One of the reasons was, of course, Uncle Tom's Cabin had convinced much of the British populace that slavery was bad and that they didn't want to support a slave country. That's one reason. Another reason why it was that England actually had built up a surplus of cotton over the years, and they weren't actually that really in need of cotton at the time, so it wasn't really worth picking a fight. Okay, that was another. And then the last option was they could get cotton from other sources, like Egypt. Okay, so for all those reasons, you know, it, it, it just didn't pan out. So. Okay, so that's that. All right. Any questions on the trend affair? Okay, so let's finish up. So last thing, I think this is my last thing. Let's talk about war aims. Um, if we had to say who had the easier goal to achieve, that's what we're looking at. Who, who's got the, hard, you know, the easier goal? Is it the South or is it the North? What do you think? It's the South, right? Right, the South is really, I mean, think about it. The Southern goal was to declare independence, to see. They've already done it. Their goal has been achieved. Now all they have to do is hold on to it. The North, think about this, the North has to go now, attack the South at home, where they are at, and drag them back into the Union, kicking and screaming. That is not easy. <laughs> okay? The South is fighting, well, in theory, they will be fighting mostly a defensive war. It is always preferable to fight defensively than offensively. Why? Well, when you fight defensively, you get to pick the place of battle. You have all your supplies at your back. You don't have to bring them with you. The enemy is forced to fight on foreign soil that they don't know. Okay? So it's always more advantageous to fight defensively. So the South, if they want to, all they can do is sit back and let the North come to them and fight. Okay, the North has the much more difficult task ahead of them. Now, that's not to say that the Confederacy doesn't ever go offensive. They do. The Confederacy, at several times, will push the war into what we consider northern territory. The most significant, of course, is the Battle of Gettysburg. But, for the most part, the South had the easier task ahead of them. Just like the Americans had the easier task. Remember the American Revolution, we said the Americans, all they had to do to win was not lose. Remember I said that? That's kind of what the South had to do. They just had to not lose. Now, that may sound dumb, but it makes sense. Because remember, the South doesn't have to go in, conquer Washington, D.C., kill Abraham Lincoln. Oh, okay. yeah. All they got to do is drag the war out until the North gets tired. And if the North gets tired of fighting, they'll quit. So the South had 
arguably the easier agenda ahead of them. Okay, so with that remains to be seen. All right, so what we're going to pick up today is we're actually going to start talking a little bit about the war itself. We've talked about up to the beginning of the war, what were the relative advantages and disadvantages of each side. So now we're actually getting to the beginning of the war. All right, so the first thing we're going to get to is we're going to talk about strategy, okay? Now we talked a little bit about Confederate strategy, now we're going to talk about the Union. So the Union had the, uh, the more difficult task ahead of them. They were the ones who actually had to go into the South and actually take the fight to them to win. Okay, so you see there, okay, the Union strategy basically had three parts. In the video we watched the other day identified these, but here they are again. Mr. Moore. Hey. Yes. Okay. Sure. Oh, okay. No problem. Hey, Lee. Uh, go see Miss Rowan. She just has to give you something. You'll be right back. Oh. You're not in trouble. Okay. Um, all right. So, anyways, the Union strategy has three parts. Okay. Uh, the first part is very important. Okay, using the naval advantage that the Union possessed, they were going to blockade the South. Okay, so they're going to cut the South off from its access to the sea, preventing them from doing trade with Europe, selling that cotton to fund the war. Very important. Okay, they're going to kind of choke them, you know, uh, economically, so they cannot fund the war. Then the plan was to divide the Confederacy in two. Okay, in addition to invading from the North. They were going to then take control of the Mississippi River, send troops up the Mississippi, splitting the Confederacy in two, okay, dividing it and weakening it as a whole. Okay, lastly, they were going to raise an army, okay, and they, from the north, march on Richmond and seize the capital. Okay, so that was the original plan. So, once again, you know, you don't have to be too specific, but the idea is the blockade, split the Confederacy in two, invade from the north. That's basically the plan. Okay? And of course this was a very difficult task because of course this is a very large country and this would create a battlefront that would be more than a thousand miles long, which would be very difficult to control. And they're going to very quickly realize that 500,000 men, which is a very large number, is not going to be enough to really achieve that goal. So it's going to actually involve more men. All right? Now this whole plan is collectively referred to as the Anaconda Plan. Okay, the name and kind of like the snake, the constrictor, because they are encircling the Confederacy and they're going to squeeze it from all sides. Okay, cut it off from its life supply, which is the cotton sale, and then eventually invade and finish it off. Okay, so this brings us to our first major land battle. Okay, it's not the first shot of the war by any means, those were at Fort Sumter, but the first major land engagement of the war was the first battle of Bull Run also known as the First Battle of Manassas. The North and South oftentimes refer to battles by different names, so sometimes you gotta know both names. But they're the same thing, Manassas or Bull Run, the same battle. So, the video talked about this, but anyways, this uh, battle was fought in July of 1861, not far from Washington, D.C., it was actually very close to our nation's capital. Okay, the two sides, North and South, engaged each other in large numbers, you can see both sides, collectively had around, you know, 17 or 18,000 men. So this was the first major battle of the war. And of course, at this point, both sides were under the, the assumption that it only required maybe a single or a few major battles to actually determine the outcome of the war. This was still when they were under the presumption that, okay, this is going to be a very quick war. And both sides had pretty high, you know, aspirations of victory. Okay, now ultimately, we watched the video on this, ultimately, Though the North initially was winning the battle, when the Confederates received reinforcements largely under the control of the, uh, the Confederate General uh, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, they managed to turn the tide of the battle and win and force the Union troops into full retreat, in which they had to basically retreat all the way back to Washington, D.C. Okay, so the Union was on the run. So this was a, a very humiliating loss to the North, but believed that they would very easily defeat the Confederates. Now, the very, you know, what, what's interesting thing here is that this actually has a major course effect on the course of the war. The Union loses this battle. They're very much embarrassed by that. And they realize quickly the South, despite their inferior numbers, 
are a very difficult foe to beat. So because of that, the Union now kind of starts digging in for a long war. They go, okay, this is going to be a much tougher war than we thought. And because of that, the Union starts making preparations for a long-term, large-scale war. So in some ways, this loss actually is going to benefit the Union in the long run because it actually makes them approach the war in a more serious manner. Now, the South, on the other hand, they now become more cavalier. They beat the Yankee troops. They think, oh, this is easy. These guys are weak. We can beat them. We're going to have no problem. In fact, they don't even follow up. The Confederates, while they had the advantage, they could have marched on Washington, D.C. They could have pursued those troops all the way back to Washington, D.C. They might have been able even to see the nation's capital, which would have been a huge political victory for them. But they don't. In their cavalier attitude, they kind of say, hey, we've got this. We're going to win this war. So it has been argued that while this defeat for the Union was a blow to their morale, it did actually tear them for a long, drawn war. And the, now on the other side of the coin, you know, the Confederates, by winning in such a decisive manner early on, it actually hurt them because they were not prepared for a long-term war. But ultimately, the winner of the first battle was the Confederacy. In fact, if you had to, uh, if you had to kind of say how the war went generally, in the first year, two years of the war, all, you, know, you could argue that the Confederacy probably had the upper hand in terms of battlefield victories. It's not until the latter part of the war when the war really starts getting drawn out. The North and its numbers advantage really comes to play. Now let's talk about leadership. We talk about military leaders, right? We already said that at the beginning of the war, the South had the greater supply of military commanders. Now the North, you know, it went through a series of military commanders. You know, I'm not going to talk about all of them, um, but you should know a few, okay? Lincoln's kind of style was, I'll let anyone have a shot at the, the kind of the, the top job, and if you are successful, you get to keep your job. If you're not, you're fired. Okay? Now, the first guy that Lincoln turned to, and I'm talking about the very first, before the war got going, was General Winfield Scott. He was by far our most experienced commander. There he is. His nickname was Old Fuss and Feathers, which is really weird. Uh, he was, of course, one of the great heroes of the Mexican-American War. But the Mexican-American War, it was pretty long ago when you think about it. He was pretty old already by that point. So, Winfield Scott was old. He was overweight. He wasn't even able to ride the battle with his troops. He probably wasn't going to be able to get the job done. So, very quickly, Lincoln said, okay, you're going to be using it. We're going to consult with you. You can give us some of your strategy. He kind of had some thoughts on the Anaconda plan. But then very quickly, Lincoln said, okay, I'm going to try someone else. So, the guy that Lincoln turned to initially was this guy, George McClellan. George McClellan was a very young, up-and-coming Military general, everyone kind of thought he was going to be the next, you know, brilliant military mind in American history. He's, you know, very, very intelligent. He had all these thoughts. But he actually isn't going to work out. Okay, McClellan is going to be heavily criticized because he's not decisive. He doesn't take the initiative and attack. Okay, he never takes chances. He's very conservative. He's not very bold. And he doesn't make the moves necessary to win this war. And Lincoln is going to get fed up with him. Now, ultimately, I'm jumping way ahead. Ultimately, by the war's end, Lincoln will find a general that will get the job done. The guy he ultimately finds is someone you would not have expected to be a very good general, and that's Ulysses Grant. By the war's end, Ulysses Grant, who was a very unassuming man, turns out to be Lincoln's best general. And what makes Grant great is that not that Grant was a brilliant military mind about tactics and all that. What Grant realized was he was more about, he knew how to manage the war. He understood the idea that this is a war and you have to win with numbers. And if you're going to win a war, Sometimes you've got to move some lives. And what Grant is willing to do, which may not have made him very popular with his men, is he was willing to go into battle and lose two men for every one the enemy lost if they could win the battle. Okay, so they, he, was, he was what we call like a blood and guts commander. He was willing to lose lives in order to win battles. So Grant, he's the kind of the first gentleman that realized that this is a war we have to fight on an industrial scale. You can win through numbers. And while you know, that's not you know, the typical thing we associate with greatness in military leadership, it does work. So Grant's going to turn out to be the, the, the North's greatest general by war's end. Okay, but that, before Grant takes over, it was McClellan. In fact, when Lincoln went to McClellan, he said, you know, are you up to task? McClellan's famous quote said, I can do it all. Give me the job. So McClellan initially was in command of the bulk of the Northern Army. He had the most say when it came to overall strategy and course of war. And you actually see that's the Lincoln actually meeting with McClellan. Okay. Now the problem, of course, was McClellan wasn't active enough. Okay, in the first year, two years of the war, McClellan was not 
on the offensive enough. McClellan was always hesitant to act. Even when McClellan had a two-to-one number of advantage over the South, he would not press his advantage because he was always worried that the South had more people than they, they were showing, that there was some kind of counterattack waiting to get him. He was very cautious. And because he was very inactive, he soon became widely criticized, even by Lincoln. Lincoln oftentimes would wire him on Telegram and say, look, are you going to attack sometime today? You know, if you're not, I have commanders who could use those troops. So of course, here's a political cartoon that's actually poking fun at McClellan as an activity. And here he is looking at the Confederates across the Potomac while all his men are, you know, gallivanting about down there. They're, they're not fighting. Okay, so Lincoln was very quickly getting fed up with McClellan and was going to make a change. Now, on the Confederate side, they had a bunch of talented military leaders. One had made a name for himself at the very first big battle, and that was Thomas Stonewall Jackson. He got that nickname Stonewall because at the battle when his troops arrived, he stood like a stone wall and repulsed the Union advance. He's largely considered to be one of the more brilliant tacticians of the war. He will die by war's end. Okay, so he's not going to see the end of the war. That's a big loss for the Confederates. Another is George Pickett, who uh, is most famous for leading one of the bravest, if not, you know, but maybe not the most intelligent decisions of the war, which is Pickett's charge of the Battle of Gettysburg, which we'll look at. But the top guy, top guy for the Confederates was the famed General Robert E. Lee, who, if you recall, Lincoln had asked to be the commander of his army at the beginning of the war, he was widely considered to be our best general, but Lee had declined because he had felt allegiance to his home state of Virginia. So both sides pretty much agreed that Lee was the best general, but the Confederates are the ones who ultimately had him. Okay, and he does a, a pretty good job with the limited resources the South have. So that's what they had. Okay, so the war is fought kind of in a couple different phases that all are happening simultaneously, okay? Now, the most intense fighting of the war arguably takes place in the East, in the Eastern theater, right? Because, of course, that's where the majority of the people were and that's where the capitals were. And, in fact, if you look at it, most of the heavy fighting, both early on and towards the end of the war even, is fought really in a narrow stretch of land right here. Between the two capitals, okay, here's Richmond, here's Washington, D.C., in this kind of 100-mile span here, that's where we see a lot of the most heavy fighting, of course, because that was the kind of border between the two states. And that's where they devoted most of their troops. So particularly in the first couple of years of the war, we see a lot of heavy fighting taking place. You know, Phoenix Valley, we were talking about the Battle of Bull Run. There's Bull Run. Okay, but there were other major battles. Battle of Fredericksburg, you might have heard of the Seven Days Battle. Yeah, there's a lot of them. I'm not going to require you to know all these. You should just know the ones I'm going to talk about and the ones that are on your map. All right, but the first... Big one, really, the follow-up to Bull Run that I want you to know is the Battle of Antietam. This is a big deal. You definitely want to know this one. This one has a big impact on the war. So Antietam was fought on one day, September 17, 1862. Can I put the date? No. It wouldn't hurt, but it's not absolutely necessary. So on September 17, 1862, we get the Battle of Antietam, which was, up to this point, the biggest engagement of the war. It is also the single bloodiest day of the war. That's one of its claims of fame. Okay? There's no other day in uh, the Civil War where more casualties were had. You see 23,000 casualties in just one day of fighting. This was a very bloody battle. Okay? Now, we talk about outcome. Well, this one's a little hazy. Okay, sometimes it's considered a stalemate. Um, you know, it's really hard to, to determine the victor. Both sides pretty much lost similar numbers. At the end of the day, both sides withdrew. They did not continue fighting in over the night. They said, okay, we're going to go ahead and cease fighting for the day. Um, if you had to choose, you'd probably say it was a Union victory simply because the outcome that's going to happen as a result of the battle is more than Union favor. But when we talk about the actual battle itself, it's very hard to say who was the clear victor. But overall, at the end of the day, the Union is going to benefit the most. Now, why is Antietam so important? Well, as I mentioned before, it's the bloody single day of the war. But it led to big changes in the war. First of all, after Antietam, despite the fact that the Union Army performed well, and they did, it performed very well, Antietam was one of the first major battles in which the Union kind of stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Confederates. At the end of the battle, 
Lincoln was angry because McClellan did not pursue the Confederate forces who were pulling back. Lincoln wanted McClellan to chase after the power of McClellan, knowing his men were exhausted and also fearing that the Confederates might have more troops coming up to reinforce them, would not press his advantage as he was known to do. So McClellan, because he did not press his advantage, was fired by Lincoln. Lincoln said, I've had enough of you. You're out. And McClellan, of course, was very angry because he felt like he had done a good job, yet here he was getting relief from duty. Okay? Now, the key thing here is this, though. At the same time that Antietam was being fought, the South was pressing England, in particular, and Europe, asking them to give them foreign aid and recognition. They were trying to get some help, whether it be monetary assistance or a navy or even troops. They just wanted Europe to recognize them as legitimate so they could actually now begin asking for some resources. When they were unable to defeat the North in this major battle, Europe kind of looked on this and said, okay, the Confederates are no longer really a favorite in this war. We are not sure they can win. No one wants to back a loser. So the, the, the loss at Antietam, or the, the failure to win at Antietam, is what can finally really convinces Europe to stay out of this conflict. After Antietam, there's no serious you know, interest in getting involved in this war by European countries. So that's a big deal. Lastly, this is also important, the North managed to turn Antietam into a political victory. They claimed it as a victory, even though, like I said, it was kind of unclear who won. The North claimed this is a huge victory. And in a way, it was. It was the first time the North really stood toe-to-toe -to -toe in a big, big battle against the top commanders in the Confederate Army and actually were able to not lose, if not win. So the North said, this is a win. And they pumped it up in the newspapers. We won. This is a big victory. The North celebrated. So... Riding off of that victory, Lincoln said, okay, I'm going to use, while everyone's feeling good, but we won a big battle, while everyone's feeling good, I'm going to take advantage of the good feelings, and I'm going to go ahead and do something, something that I wanted to do, but was afraid to do. So following the victory in Antietam, Lincoln began calling, or making plans to issue an Emancipation Proclamation, which will free the slaves. Okay, this is something Lincoln would not dare have done in the beginning of the war because he was afraid he would lose those border states, okay? And he also did not want to prolong the war. But now, it's clear this is going to be a long war. It's going to cause a lot of bloodshed. And Lincoln's basically thought is, we're not going to do this twice. We're not going to fight this war again 10 years later. We're going to fight this war over slavery one time. So this is key to understanding the Civil War. This decision to free the slaves, the Emancipation Proclamation, now changes the moral goal of the war from simply being about preserving the Union. Now the war has become not only about preserving the Union, it's also about ending slavery. This gives the North the upper hand in terms of morality. They are fighting a moral war. Okay, So this is a huge deal. I can't stress this enough. You better know this. Emancipation Proclamation after Antietam. Very Let's talk about the Emancipation Proclamation, which is one of the most misunderstood executive actions in history. Alright, so the Emancipation Proclamation was not you know, something that, you know, Lincoln really had to consult Congress on. And Lincoln just said, we're going to do this. He took it upon himself and, he, you know, the immense power of the United States said, I'm just going to do this. And probably it's, it's the most impactful or bold act by a president maybe in our entire country's history, right? So what did it do? Well, the Emancipation Proclamation, everyone knows, everyone's pretty familiar with it, freed the slaves, right? Well, yes and no, right? And this map shows you just how complicated it really was. What the Emancipation Proclamation did was it freed the slaves in a select area. Okay? It did not free all the slaves in all of the United States. So you need to know that. So what did it do? The Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves, and here's the key part, in territory still in rebellion. He freed the slaves and territory still in rebellion, which on this map is demonstrated by the green states with horizontal lines. Horizontal lines have to be there. You'll notice Tennessee has vertical lines. So the Emancipation Proclamation did not apply that. So let me make this clear. So who, what areas were not affected by the Emancipation Proclamation? Well, first of all, the border states. Lincoln did not free the slaves in the border states, which were Union states. So slavery still existed in the Union. Okay? 
you can pr pretty much guess why. Lincoln did not free the slaves in the four states because he was afraid that if he did, he might lose them. And he needed them. They were his allies. Okay? He only freed the slaves in territory still real in rebellion. All right? So, day one, now this went into effect January 1st, 1863. It started on the first day of the year. This went into effect. So, the question to you is, on January 1st, 1863, how many slaves were freed? Zero. He freed no slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation on day one. Because he was freeing slaves in territory civil in rebellion. Well, what's the problem there? They're rebelling. Why would they list it? Lincoln's not their president. Why would they? That would be like you know, the president of the United States saying to Canada, hey, you need to do something like this. Do this. Here's what universal health is. Like, what? No, you're not our president. That's how they viewed it, right? So you might think, well, what's the point? Well, it did have a point. The point is this. Yes, Lincoln did not have any power to free the slaves in the rebelling states, but as the North pushes into these territories throughout the course of the war and comes across slaves, those slaves are immediately liberated. It also had the byproduct of slaves in the South, upon hearing about the Emancipation Proclamation, when that news reaches them, it only encourages them to defect and run away and try to reach the Union lines. Now you didn't have to reach Canada to be free. You didn't even have to reach the North. All you had to do was reach the Union Army. If you could reach the Union Army, you were now liberated. Okay, you were liberated because you were, you know, liberated as a result of the Emancipation Proclamation. So yes, no one was freed on January 1st, 1863, but as the war progresses, slaves will be liberated in the South. Okay? But the key thing to note here is that the Emancipation Proclamation does not end slavery. Slavery is not ended. Slavery still exists. Okay, it still exists in the border states. It exists in territories that the Union has not reached. And even in Tennessee, Tennessee was a Confederate state, but the reason why the slaves in Tennessee were not liberated is because the Union Army already controlled it by 1863. It was occupied. They already invaded. So even those slaves got to stay in slavery. Okay? So it was a very controversial thing. Now, slavery will ultimately be ended, but not until the end of the war. So keep that in mind. The Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery, but it was a huge step in the direction of ending slavery. Okay? So don't misunderstand that. All right, now the other thing the Emancipation Proclamation did, and that Lincoln allowed after Antietam, was the Union Army now began recruiting black soldiers. Okay? At the beginning of the war, black soldiers had been rejected, but by now, the North was desperate. They needed more men. Okay? And, you know, part of this whole push for equality and into slavery would then, of course, entail, well, why not allow these people who are fighting to liberate? Let's let them fight. So starting in 1863, the Union Army began recruiting black soldiers. Black soldiers would serve in segregated units. They could only serve in all black units. Okay, so there was a form of discrimination and racism still alive, obviously. Okay, uh, they served in all black units and they served under white officers. As a general rule, black soldiers were not promoted above the, uh, the ranks that they enlisted them in. They, had, they could not become the higher level officers. So there was still discrimination in the Northern Army. Okay, but they were being allowed to serve. Okay, and by war's end, African American soldiers fought in battles all over okay, the country. You can see uh, these, all these dots on the map represent battles in which African American soldiers served. Hundreds of thousands of blacks ultimately served honorably in the U.S. military. Okay, probably the most famous of which, and the first of which, was the 54th Colored Massachusetts Regiment. Okay, the 54th in Massachusetts was the first all-black uh, regiment in our, our, our country's history. Okay, and there you see uh, one of their most uh, famous moments was when they stormed the Confederate Fort, Fort Wagner. They led a frontal assault on the fort. They were the lead regiment going in. They volunteered to go in first, knowing that they would take heavy losses. And this was kind of a big moment because the Lord Blacks were trying to prove that, you know, they were very much as capable as fighting as white soldiers. And they led the charge. Of course, if you've ever seen the movie Glory, which came out a long time ago now, it's like the early 90s it came out. Glory tells a story about the 54th. It's a very good movie, so if you get a chance, watch that. Okay? And of course, as the North went into the South, they continued freeing more slaves, okay, which were considered contraband of war, illegal. 
Okay, even before, actually, I should make this clear, even before the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, Union troops, as they went into Southern territory, were actually liberating slaves. They were, they were doing it in a very kind of quasi-legal way. The way they were liberating slaves was they were coming across these slaves, they were saying, well, slaves are property, property of the Confederacy. And any property of the Confederacy is being used to commit rebellion, which is treasonous. So Union troops were actually freeing slaves long before the Emancipation Proclamation under the rules of war and calling them contraband. But of course, after the Emancipation Proclamation, now we had actual black soldiers going into the South and actually freeing other uh, you know, black slaves. Okay, and you can imagine just about how mind-blowing this being. These slaves were actually seeing soldiers, black soldiers in the Union uniform coming into their territory and liberating them. And of course, many of the slaves that were freed by these soldiers ended up also serving in the Union Army. So in some cases, you actually had former slaves serving in the Union Army against their former masters, which is pretty a neat, pretty neat thing when you think about it. Okay, now, as I mentioned before, though, you know, black participation was not fully you know, equal in even the Union Army. Even though the North allowed blacks to serve, it was not necessarily a fair and equitable thing. Okay, so by war's end, blacks made up about 10% of the Union troops. The type here, I should say higher casualty rates. Okay, uh, there tend to be higher casualty rates in black units, which means they're more likely to be injured or killed. Okay, that could be for a lot of reasons. Um, it could be that Black units were being selected to do the most dangerous tasks. It could be black units were volunteering for the more dangerous tasks. It, it could be a lot of things. Okay, it could be because they weren't receiving as much training and instruction as white troops. We don't. We're not really sure why. Okay. Initially, blacks received lower pay than whites. Although by war's end, this was remedied. Blacks protested this. They said, "You know, why should we be paid less when we're doing the same job?" So there was actually some wage equality. They are disproportionately assigned to labor work. So particularly early on, blacks oftentimes were not using combat. They were used to do labor work. That eventually changed by war's end. Very few, if any, black officers. For the most part, blacks were restricted from being officers. And in many cases, black soldiers would receive substandard supplies. Okay? They were the last to get outfitted. All right. So once again, even though the North did oppose slavery and did allow blacks to serve, it doesn't mean there was, you know, no discrimination. There was plenty of discrimination in the Northern Army. Okay, now another thing, in 1863, as an attempt to boost sagging numbers, not only did the North allow black soldiers, they also now initiated the draft. Starting in 1863, the North began to draft soldiers, meaning they began to forcibly conscript civilians and say, okay, you have to serve. And this is because by 1863, the number of volunteers had dropped because now people were realizing, okay, this war is not going to end anytime soon. The war was becoming unpopular in the North. So they needed to find a way to get the troops. So they initiated the draft. Now the problem was, and this is the problem with the draft in all of American history, is that every time we've ever had the draft, we've always had kind of a system in place to allow some people to avoid it. Okay, we've, we've really not ever had a truly fair draft. All right, and during the Civil War, what made this unfair was you could buy your way out of military service. Okay, there was two methods by which you could avoid the draft in the Civil War. One was you could literally pay a fee and you could have your draft status waived. So if your number was called, you could actually pay okay, money to the government and they would basically say, okay, you don't have to serve and your name would go back in the lottery. Okay. The other way you could avoid service, which was less common, was you could actually hire a person to go serve in your stead. Now the person had to want you, you know, they had to volunteer for it, but if someone wanted money, okay, they could actually sell themselves and say, okay, I'm going to go serve in, in the name of this person. Those are known as substitutes. Okay. So you could buy your way out in one of two ways. Now the problem here, of course, which you know with the system is, of course, the only people who could buy their way out of service were the wealthy. So this exacerbated the problem was, as in many wars, the wars were largely being fought. The people who were fighting the war were largely people who were you know, poor. Okay? And that's really been the case with all of our wars in history, is that the poor tend to be the ones who end up doing the fighting. Okay? And oftentimes it's been criticized that the poor 
are fighting and dying for really causes that the rich support. But uh, that was the case here as well. So this was a very, you know, discriminatory s system. And of course, people knew that and they, they, they widely protested it. Now, one of the examples of this that's kind of famous and you should probably know, it shows just how controversial, you know, we like to think that everyone in the North was on board the Civil War. They weren't. There was plenty of people in the North who opposed this war and believed that it should not be fought. And one of the examples of this is when the North initiated the draft, there was a lot of opposition. Because now, not only was the war unpopular, but now you were actually making people who didn't believe in the war fight. And there was a lot of people, particularly you know, in cities, that opposed the war. You know, a lot of immigrants didn't believe. A lot of people who were foreign immigrants did not believe in this war because they did not want to fight and die for slavery. Because they did not believe in the idea of you know, blacks inequality. Okay? And in New York City, for example, we had the draft riots. July 13th to 16th, we had major riots all over New York City in response to the initiation of the draft. The poor sections of the city erupted in riots, and they actually attacked and burned the richest parts of the city because they felt that the rich were avoiding service and forcing the poor to go fight a war that they did not support. And in fact, many of the, the, the people in New York who opposed the war, you know, many of them, of course, which were first-generation immigrants, they took out this hostility not only on the rich, but also on free blacks. During the draft riots, many uh, free blacks were attacked and murdered because they blamed them for this war. So this kind of shows just how tense the situation was in the North, because even in 1860, people said, hey, we should end this war. This was a very, very controversial war. All right, so let's go back to the war itself, and let's talk about the war in the West. Now, while they were fighting the East, we also had fighting in the West, okay? Out more in the remote areas and more in the frontier-like areas, we had fighting as well, okay? A lot of major battles out there, and you don't need to know all these battles, but, you know, you can see the movements of the troops all over. The blue represents the movements of Union troops, and the red represents the movements of Confederate troops, okay? But this is all part of that effort to divide the Confederacy in half. So, let's talk about a major battle. Battle of Vicksburg, Siege of Vicksburg. Vicksburg was a major Confederate stronghold located directly on the Mississippi River. Basically, by this point in the war, Vicksburg was the last remaining Confederate stronghold preventing the Union from completing the Anaconda Plan. Okay? So from May 18th to July 4th, the Union Army laid siege, which means they surrounded the city, they cut it off from supplies, and they shelled it, all with the purpose of trying to get Vicksburg to surrender. This was a big deal. If they could take Vicksburg, they now had the Mississippi, which meant the Confederacy was divided in two, and they could ship men up and down at will. Okay, the general in charge of this was General Ulysses Grant, this is him down here in the corner with the spyglass. Okay, and after laying siege to the, the city for nearly, say, two months, on July 4th, Vicksburg surrendered. By this point, the, the defenders inside were down to eating rats. They had no food. They had to surrender. So this was huge. Taking Vicksburg completed the part of the Anaconda Plan in which they needed the Mississippi River. Now, the South had been divided, okay, which meant the war was now turning in favor of the North. All right, so this is a major Union victory in the West. It also makes Grant a very big name and will catapult him into being kind of the lead general in the Army. Now here's the kind of neat thing. At the exact same time that Vicksburg was getting to fall, we had the greatest battle of the war being fought in the east. Okay. Now this war was actually fought on northern soil. By this point in the war, the south was getting kind of desperate. Now, don't get me wrong, this war was still up for grabs. No one knew who was going to win. Okay. But the south was realizing, okay, if this war drags out too long, we're not going to win. So the South goes, how can we get out of this? How can we win? So an election is coming up. Okay, 1864 is going to be an election year. Lincoln's going to be up for re-election. Lincoln is, you know, kind of unpopular in a lot of areas of the United States because people don't believe the war. And there's a growing size, sizable portion of the population north of are opposed the war. The South realizes if we can turn the population against Lincoln, if they vote him out in 1864, whoever gets voted in, will probably want to end the war. So the goal for the South is we need to make Lincoln unpopular, we need to get him out. So the, the South devises a plan. They're going to invade the North. 
They're going to actually go into the north. Not, they're not going to just defend themselves. They're going to go into the north, and they want to win a major battle on northern soil. And if they do, it will hurt Lincoln's chances at re-election. And of course, in addition to helping the war effort. So the plan is to invade the north, okay, which they do. And on July 1st, we get a major clash between two major forces okay, at Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. This will be the biggest battle of the war. Okay, it is also the most deadly over multiple days. I know that I said in Tiedem with the blaze, it's a blaze single day. Gettysburg, the death toll is much higher, but it lasts three days. Okay, so Gettysburg is the most famous battle of the war, and with good reason. Now, long story short, you know, for this class, you don't need to know, know all the tactics. But anyways, over three days of fighting, ultimately, the Union is going to prevail, okay? You can see here, the green represents the Union positions, the red is the Confederates. The Confederates were attacking the Union troops. Now, the Union had the numbers advantage, as always, and they were now on the defense. They actually had the defensive advantage. They were actually entrenched on an elevated position, which gave them an advantage over the Confederates. On the last day of the battle, the Confederates got desperate, and they tried to launch this desperate frontal assault on the Union lines, part of which was this uh, charge called Pickett's Charge, led by General Pickett. And when they tried to assault the Union lines on something called Cemetery Ridge, which was an elevated position that was well defended by the Union troops. Well, the Confederates that attacked were massacred. They had to cross open field, nearly a mile of territory, while under direct rifle, cannon, and canister fire. Canister fire, by the way, if you don't know, it's like buckshot for a cannon. They blow up a cannon with a bunch of shrapnel, and they shoot it out, and it, it, it's really deadly. Anyways, long story short, the Confederates are defeated, and they are forced to go into retreat. So their attempt to invade the North ends in failure, and they lose a lot of men in the process. This is a huge Union victory. The greatest Union victory of the war in many ways. Okay? It was also very bloody, as I said. The casualties were staggering. The numbers involved, the Union Army had 75,000 men, the Confederates only had 50,000. Now, despite being outnumbered, the Confederates did manage to perform very well. They did inflict 23,000 casualties on the Union. However, the Confederate Army lost over half their men. They will not ever fully recover from this loss. This is a big deal. This was the big showdown everyone was waiting for. After Gettysburg, the South will never again entertain a serious idea of invading the North. They will strictly fight a defensive war, and they will hold on for as long as they can, but it's clear that things are not going in their favor. So their plan backfired. Okay, now we consider Vicksburg and Gettysburg as the turning point site together because they both happened at the exact same time, right? Vicksburg fell on July 4th, Gettysburg ended on July 3rd. So what we do is we lump them together. Even though they were two different battles, we lump them together and combine they are our turning point of the war. After those two battles, the Union is now in firm control. Okay, Vicksburg gave the Union control of the Mississippi River to split the South in half, as I said. Gettysburg destroyed much of the Confederate Army and of course was a huge blow to their morale. And after which, the South is in full retreat. Now, the war is going to go on still for two more years. The war is not over. But from here on in, the, the, the South has to fight a much more calculated defensive war. They have to hold on to what they've got for as long as they can. The South's only hope at this point is to drag the war out, make it as bloody as possible, and hope that the North says, we've had enough. Okay? If, the, if they can get the North to say, we just want a peace agreement, we'll leave you alone, that's their goal. Okay? But if this war goes on a long time, the South really doesn't have any hope of winning at this point. They're vastly outnumbered, okay, and they do not have the resources to continue on. So combined, Gettysburg and Vicksburg, that is our turning point. Very important. Okay, any questions on that so far? Got a little bit more to cover today. I'm gone. I'm good. All right, so what this map shows you is the progress of the war. So this war is gradual in its progression. Each color represents a different year and how much territory the Union had taken. So by 1861, the Union was here. By 1862, they had pushed, you know, pushed further. By 1863, you can see, they have Vicksburg, they have this the Mississippi River here, okay? They control all this territory. And all of a sudden, in 1864, you get something really weird. Now, the war has been progressing pretty steadily. It's like a line, a battle line, moving down, 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 down. In 1864, you see this weird thing happen. You see this 
kind of path that the Union takes across the Confederacy. Instead of pushing down the line, they cut across through Georgia. That's very important. That's a very important campaign in the war that helped end the war. It's an odd choice by the Union, but it was very effective. So what, that, what you're seeing there is the famous Sherman's campaign, his march to the sea. Okay, so Tecumseh Sherman was one of the Union generals, one of the top generals. He was Grant's kind of right-hand man by this point. And by 1864, the Union wanted to put this war to rest. So they said, okay, we're taking the gloves off. We're not messing around. So Grant tells Sherman, he says, look, I want you to do whatever you can to destroy the South's willingness to fight. I want you to take away their spirit. Okay? So Sherman, he begins this march. He sets out from Tennessee and he marches across Georgia with his army. And on his march to the sea, because his goal, of course, is the coast, he destroys everything in his path. He fights battles, but more importantly, he wages war on the southern infrastructure. So what does that mean? He burns homes. He burns farms. He slaughters cattle. He, destroy, he destroys railroad lines. Anything he comes across, he destroys. This was new. Up to this point, warfare had been kind of chivalrous. And what I mean by that is there was this kind of code of honor amongst our soldiers that, you know, you're my opponent, I respect you, we're going to meet at this place, we're going to fight, we're not going to hurt civilians, you know, we're not going to, you know, try and harm our, our way of life, we're just going to fight each other on the battlefield. It's almost like a sport, right? So now the war has become much dirtier. Okay, now the war is about we're going to punish everyone. We're going to hurt your entire country to end this war. Because even though Sherman, I'm telling you, Sherman wasn't rounding up citizens and killing them. He wasn't killing women and children. Okay, not directly. I'm not saying that people didn't get killed. They did. But, but he was still hurting people because by destroying their economy and destroying their homes, that hurts civilians, right? So and he was doing this on purpose. The idea here, this is a concept known as total war which has only been really around in the modern sense since about this time period. Total war is a lot of things, but one of these total wars is the idea of hurting everyone. Okay? The goal here is not to be just cruel and ruthless. The goal is you want to end the war as quick as possible. How can you end the war as quick as possible? By making the civilian population miserable. If you hurt the civilians, they will then demand their government bring it into the war. Okay, so this is kind of a new concept at this point, at least in the modern era. Okay, it's only become more and more well known as, as we go into the future. We get to World War One and World War Two. Total War is going to become more exacerbated. You know, of course, you guys know in the future we're going to start bombing civilians and purposely killing them, and then put the purpose of any war. So that's Total War at its, you know, really most distilled versions. You know, actually direct attacks and something. So this was a pretty terrible thing. Of course, the South, they were horrified. They couldn't believe this was going on. They, they, they proclaimed that Lincoln and Sherman were war criminals. Okay, what they were doing was illegal. And maybe it was. But of course, Sherman and Lincoln are never going to be punished. Why? They win. They win. And as you guys are probably aware, winners write history. When you win, you don't get punished. When you lose, you get tried as a war criminal. Okay, so Lincoln is never going to, even though it's a day, so there are many some who say what Lincoln did was wrong, what Sherman did was wrong. But they will not be punished. And it's very effective. It does break the will of the South to fight. Sherman's March to Sea was devastating. It will help speed up the end of the war. Okay, so keep that in mind. 